Our next segment, we're going to devote attention to the, uh, the families the, the families of those who are victims of preemptive prosecution, uh, the situation of the, pr the, the, the prisoners and, and their families. And we believe this is important because you can hear it directly from people who are either family members or very close to the uh, family members. And um, hopefully there will be also time for question and answers um, regarding this segment as well. And to begin, I'm going to introduce uh, Kazi Tour. And Kazi Tour is a former political prisoner, longtime community organizer, and freedom fighter. Kazi was the first uh, new African convicted of seditious conspiracy in the, in the United States, for which he served nearly 10 years in prison. He relates to the words of Gil Scott Heron. For those who may not know Gil Scott Heron, he was probably the first of the, of, of the rappers. He said, I have believed in my convictions and have been convicted for my beliefs. Um, conned by the Constitution and harassed by the police. I've been billed for the Bill of Rights and been treated like I was wrong. He has served as co-chair for the National Jericho Movement, working for freedom for all political prisoners. He is currently a paralegal and trial consultant for the law offices of Barry P. Wilson. He is continually struggling for the liberation of all oppressed people worldwide. Kazi Tour. I want to thank, uh, first of all, I want to thank um, the organization for inviting me here to speak today. And I really, um, I really like the work that your people are doing and I encourage you to keep it up. Uh, I was arrested in, in uh, February 7, 1982. Uh, an arrest area outside of uh, on 93 down here. Uh, police that stopped us, they stopped the car. We put him on the stand and we asked him, uh, you know, why did he stop our car? He said, I wasn't used to seeing black people sitting in this rest area. So uh, we asked him, well, how many, you know, had you seen before? He said, well, I had four or five. I said, how many did you stop and search? And he's on the stand. He said, four or five. So. You mean to tell me you stopped the search every black person you saw coming in this rest area? And he said, yeah, of course. Like, you know, he said, he was the only one that wouldn't let me search him. You know, so I got arrested. But uh, as far as I could tell, we have a right not to be searched illegally. And one of the points that I learned from that is a lot of people don't stand up for themselves. Because if the four or five people had a stood up before me, maybe I wouldn't have got arrested. Because I'm going to stand up for mine. And you people need to stand up for yours. Uh, I was beat down that night, locked up, and then took to the state police station, beat down again. They stood on my face and grounded their boots in my face like they were putting out cigarette butts. Um, then, in jail, what they do, they strip you down and start spinning the uh, revolvers to the, the bars and saying, we're going to have an accident here, nigga, tonight. This is the stuff they try to put in you, the fear they try to put in you to not stand up and resist. So, uh, you know, it's a lot, a, lot, a lot of illegal moves, things that went down. Uh, I got moved about 40 times. 40 different institutions. I was in isolation for three years. Um, we organized it inside. And uh, one time, what they do, they tell you uh, in isolation, uh, you want this tray, you want this food? Get up on the bed, roll over, sit up. I thought the next thing you were going to say is bark like a dog. It's like, man, I don't want this. I don't want nothing that bad. So this went on for 13 days. And uh, I had to get a court order to be fed. But I tell you this just because you have to understand what the Muslim prison is going through inside. Anybody who dares to stand up and resist this country, that's the treatment they get. And now that they got this water boiling, and all that is legal, and Obama just continued pushes whole thing on torture. 
that's what's going on inside. It started out with the Native Americans, continue with African people, and we say New African because uh, we made up, uh, we came from many different tribes, many different nations in Africa, and once we reached here, we made up a new African community, a, a new African nation that's been treated separate, different ever since we come to these shores within a nation. And our community has been destroyed. We got people running around here waving American flags, talking about they American citizens, you know, with no equal rights. How can you be a citizen? How? If you don't have equality, you're second class, man. It's just the way it is. I didn't make it that way. That's the way it is. You know? And so, uh, this repression, you know, uh, I'll tell you one other thing. In 2004, they had openly, open surveillance on me and a lot of other people. Uh, and they didn't even care to try to hide it. They were following us everywhere we went with helicopters and all kinds of We had to have a press conference to, you know, like expose what they were doing and took down the license plates and they all go back to New York. They go to different people all around the country. It's all homeland security stuff, right? But uh, we got more police in this country, man. In Boston, <laughs> one time I was researching and I think there's something like 23 different police departments here. You know? There's cops everywhere, man. This is a police state. And fascism is what it is, what's going on in this country. And people are afraid to talk about race and racism and, you know. So, repression is not limited to, to your community. It's, it's, it's more to anyone who wants to resist this government's uh, foreign and national policy and domestic policy and their actions. Um, they're going to try and look what they do in Haiti. And Haiti never got up after Tucson. Haiti never got up. They never let them people up, man. Because they dare to resist. You ask the question. But that's what, you know, I really like what's going on here, though. I mean, people building a tight community. But one thing I just have to stress is like, in our work, we have to encompass all the people. And some of the people are being left out. When we go out to do organizing, do education work, we're not reaching those gangbangers, those people that are out there shooting each other, they ain't in here, you know? And I don't know, but I think they need to be educated too. The year I got out of prison in 1991, uh, 10,000 black youth killed 10,000 black youth in this country, you know? The height of lynching in 1919, 2,000, they lynched 2,000, the Klan lynched 2,000 of us that year in 1919. In 1991, we done killed 10,000 of ourselves. Man, we got to reach them, you know? They got to know who their friends are and they got to know who their enemies are. And the enemies, not us, not each other. Thank you for that, uh, Brother Tazi. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Leila to come up here and introduce our next speaker. And by the way, uh, Leila Murad is a 21-year-old Muslim organizer based in the Boston uh, area and a central figure in the Tariq Muhannis Support Committee. Her organizing currently has a focus on the struggle to defend and liberate Muslim and all political prisoners. Leila's work actively ref reflects her support for the resistance and self-determination of other peoples and communities in their own struggles, including but not limited to the defense of their land, resources, and bodies. Lena Murad.
speaker is Marlene Jenkins. Marlene Jenkins is from New York City where she worked as an RN at St. Luke's Hospital in, and at NYU. She and her husband worked closely with Malcolm X in the 1950s and early 60s. Marlene has five children, ten grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. She relocated to Albany in 1996 where her daughter was working for the Court of the Appeals. Marlene is a long-term long foster parent who has won awards for her commitment to working with difficult children. She works with the Center for Law and Justice, the Muslim Solidarity Committee, and Project Salam. Marlene's son, Tariq Shah, a well-known jazz bassist who, was, who played at President Clinton's inaugural in 1996, was entrapped in an unfair FBI sting operation and is serving 15 years sentence. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Marlene Jenkins and I'm the mother of Terry Shaw. <clears throat> In 2005, three months after 9-11, on December 2001, the FBI directed an agent provocateur to go after a Muslim named Farheen Islamic Bookstore in New York City and said that he wanted to send money to a jihadist brother overseas. Farheen refused to help but re referred the provocateur to Jareen Shaw, which is my son, a well-known jazz bass player self-defense trainer and martial arts teacher in New York City, who played at President Clinton's inauguration. Tariq did nothing but the provocateur, Mohammed Alansi, continued to try to get Tariq to do something illegal for three years. He was reportedly paid $100,000 for his work. In a bizarre twist in 2004, Alansi set himself on fire outside of the White House. Alansi's FBI handler, Robert Fuller was also in charge of the Newburgh 4 case in 2009 and 2010 and was implicated in the rendition and torture of Canadian citizen Maha Arar in 2002 and 2003. In 2003, the FBI assigned another agent provocateur, Theodore Shelby, a.k.a. Saeed, an ex-convict and former Black Panther to get to reach Shelby to get Tariq. Shelby asked Tariq to give him music lessons and he eventually moved into our home, which I had a house in the Bronx, and Tariq was staying and taking care of it. Tape recording every conversation. Shelby then introduced Tariq to a supposed Al-Qaeda recruiter who was actually an undercover agent, and I guess you've heard of this guy because he's been all over TV, Ali Safar who offered to read $1,000 a week if he would agree to train jihadists in martial arts. Tariq agreed, although he did not accept any money. Sufar then recruited an old friend of Tariq, Dr. Rafir, Rafiq was severe, a physician to provide medical assistance to injured combatants. Sabir, who lived at that time in Florida, was in town visiting Tariq. The New York Times wrote that the tapes revealed a plot that was almost entirely taught. No weapons appeared to have been bought, and no martial art training took place. The plot went on for two years and became a joint FBI New York Police Department sting operation. Tariq was then arrested in 2005. At his arrest, Tariq was refused legal representation was threatened with the Patriot Act and rendition. Neither his, nor his attorney nor his family, we could not find him for more than three days after his arrest. He was finally able to get some legal counsel. Behind his trial, Tariq agreed to talk in a wiretap conversation to a former martial arts student, Mahmoud Brent, who he also taught martial arts to about Brent's attendance at a training camp in Pakistan after a 9-11 run by Lasker Taibbi, a terrorist group designated thus by the U.S. government in 2001 that was fighting for the independence of Kashmir. However, once Tariq was wired and taken to Maryland for the phone call, he refused to cooperate. Then, the FBI became very annoyed with him 
and Sharif was then taken and held in solitary confinement in Metropolitan Correctional Center for more than 33 months. Facing a 30-year sentence and realizing that he could not get a fair trial and would be found guilty by association, he pleaded guilty in April of 2007 to one count of conspiracy to provide superior support, material support to terrorism. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Arheem pleaded guilty for similar reason and was sent to 13. Brent also pleaded guilty and received 15 years for his attendance at the training camp. Sabir, who pleaded not guilty, was convicted and sentenced to 25 years. He was sentenced to 25 years just because he said he was a physician and that he would treat the enemy. Tariq, who is now 47, is serving his sentence at the Medium Security Federal Prison in Petersburg, Virginia, and is scheduled for release in June 2018. He has never in his life advocated violence. He is not a terrorist. He pleaded guilty to save his family astronomical legal fees and to have some life remaining to him to spend with us upon his release. Like the Virginia pinball conviction, the government <clears throat> fastened on an innocent activity in Therese's case. His practice of martial arts and said it was evidence of terrorist activity, but any such activity was suggested and facilitated only by the FBI provocateur and agents, not Therese. The New York Times wrote that the government has acknowledged that neither Mr. Shaw nor the three others accused in the case or on the verge of any violence. Tariq was, I became a Muslim under Malcolm X. Tariq was, his, his whole life he wanted to be a musician. At the age of 13, he asked me to buy him a bass. From that moment, his passion was music only. He surrounded himself with the best musicians, always practicing, was always interested in martial arts since he was taught by his father. And at an adult, <clears throat> at an adult age, he opened a martial arts studio in Harlem and was well known by the community. The schools would call on him for help when some of the boys were totally out of control. They were very pleased with his results because he would always let them know that martial arts was discipline, not for violence. Also in the same area, Rafiq Sabir, a well-known friend and physician in Harlem, had a storefront, free clinic, treating all who could not afford to pay. They were partners in helping the community. In all of his 48 years, Tariq had never, ever been involved in any type of violence. He had never been arrested. His main focus was music and becoming a better musician. So when the government pictured him as a dangerous martial arts terrorist, I was wondering who the hell were they talking about? Tariq always opened his home to others and was always willing to help others. I used to tell him, though, that be careful because everyone you give the greetings to does not mean peace be upon you. He was a trusting, beloving person and always wanted for his brothers what he wanted for himself. So with all of that, he was truly deceived by an informant <clears throat> who he trusted, gave music lessons for over two years, opened his home. This person continued to give him and continued to give this person bass lessons. The government continuing coercion and entrapment for more than three years using more than one informant and Robert Filler, the same FBI used in the Newburgh Court case and many others. I believe he was also used in the Fort Dix Five. We must continue, and if we don't continue now to fight against all these manufactured stings and entrapment cases, my son, other sons, year after year will be entrapped. They will have to plead guilty to crimes they have not committed, and there will never be any fair trial. They will all wind up in some sort of solitary confinement, constantly cut off from the outside world. 
This is truly mental torture and is a great tool for anyone to take a plea deal. Just for some kind of normalcy. I am here not all just for my son. I am here for many other sons and for many of the young brothers and sisters who have been entrapped in these government stings. I ask all of us to get together and to do what we can to help because if we don't speak out, these young brothers and sisters cannot speak out. They are in prison and they have been sealed. Their mouths have been sealed. It's harder for them to, they can't defend themselves. They can't speak out against others because the more that they say, the worse that their um, sentences will be. So we as a people, we are the only ones that can really help them. We are the only ones that can fight for them. They put fear in us, but fear is not going to help us to get ahead. I was born and raised in the civil rights area. We fought for everything that we have gotten today. My great grandmother was a slave. She fought. My grandmother was also a hard worker and she was living in the time of, you know, when they were just always treating us like we were less than human. We fought through that and we gained and we came ahead. We have now gone back 30 years because we don't want to fight for our freedom. No one is going to give us our freedom unless we fight for it ourselves. And we must stick together for our children and for others. That is the only way that we're going to get ahead and win this fight that is going on now. So I thank all of you for coming and listening. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Jenkins. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Tarek Muhanna, born in Virginia to Egyptian parents. Dr. Tarek Muhanna is the brother of Muslim prisoner Dr. Tarek Muhanna. And uh, Tamil currently resides in Boston, Massachusetts, where he works in the pharmaceutical and biotech management consulting industry. When his brother was arrested in 2009, Dr. Mohanna uh, rallied the support of thousands of people with the help of a group of, uh, a group of associates that today constitute the Tarek Mohanna Support Committee. The committee is the core steering group for the, Thodic, uh, for the Free Tarek Campaign, a broad-based grassroots movement to bring greater attention not only to the true facts and realities of the case against his brother Tarek, but also to the cases of other Muslims who face similar circumstances in the United States without their own support mechanisms, Dr. Mahanna. Assalamu alaikum and uh, salutations. Uh, I'm going to break my, my discussion into two different parts. The first part I'll talk about Tawda, and the second part I'll talk about everything else. Um, so, Tarek, just a quick update for those who are unaware, his, uh, his court date, uh, the beginning of his trial rather, uh, was moved from October 3rd, it was moved back three weeks to October 24th, because the government uh, has released an additional 16,000 documents uh, that they refer to as, as evidence, but which we refer to as nonsense. But, um, so, Alhamdulillah, Tawla, he's in very good spirits, and uh, he's actually in better spirits and better, like, physical health than he's been at any point in his life. So, you know, that's always positive, and, you know, uh, my family is confident that, you know, things will go the way that we're looking for. I just want to point out some similarities uh, between my brother Tawla and your son Tawla. Uh, as I was listening, and it's worth pointing out because I'll get to it. So, in both cases, we have somebody who refused to cooperate, and then you have the annoyed FBI, and then you have the arrest and the imprisonment for 33 months, and then the trial, 
after already having served all this time in solitary confinement without even being convicted of anything. Um, I want to just point out one thing with respect to uh, plea deals. I think it's something that we should handle very carefully because we're trying to organize uh, a certain perspective here, which is that you know these individuals that we are trying to defend, we're trying to defend them because they're innocent. So it creates it creates added confusion in the eyes of our audience, and our audience here is like the American public. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of these issues, they already seem uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So the last thing that we want to do is add more confusion to that. Tata always spoke to me about, you know, the his staunch stance never to take a plea deal because it's not just about your case, it's about the cases that come after it, and it's the precedent that it sets, it's the perspective that it sets. But I think also the fact that like a lot of our brothers take these plea deals, unfortunately, it just amplifies the fact that, that we need to do more in order to support them. Which brings me to another point now. Um, you know, the, the fact that we see this repetition here between, let's say, like Tarek's case and another Tarek's case, and then, you know, another Muslim brother's case or another African American brother's case, you know, it's a very systematic process that is being put in place here. And like, you have to get to a point where you ask yourself, you know, like, what is the message that is being sent to us here? You know, when we're being treated like this, in a systematic way, you know, and that's the point where you really need to start seeing the writing on the wall. Because uh, history repeats itself, you know, this is, the, this is the problem with being somebody, I love reading, I love history, I love anthropology, I thought I loved history and anthropology. Look where I put him. But, um, Maybe none of us should read. <laughs> no, not that. But I mean, you know, the, the problem when you read is that you is that you realize that history repeats itself, and so it's very frustrating to see it play out before your eyes again and again, and to see everybody around you who perhaps you know, I mean, maybe they don't read history and anthropology. Maybe they read uh, Sports Illustrated. Maybe they read whatever. You know, but it's frustrating to see that play out again and again, and like you just. It feels like a madhouse, to be honest. It feels like a madhouse to see prisoner after prisoner put away, and and no no alarm going off in the minds of black Muslims. No alarm. Yesterday, I came to pray Jummah here. I came to pray Jummah here, and I asked a while ago if we could hold an event for awareness for Tata here, and I received a very polite response but nonetheless it was still a, it was still a denial and my brother he's facing life in prison based on what based on conspiracy charges listen to the listen to the list of charges the litany of charges conspiracy it's charge number one charge number two is conspiracy to provide material support to a terrorist uh, conspiracy to commit terrorism excuse me and then the third charge is conspiracy to provide material support to a terrorist organization it's, it's absurd that these types of things can happen and, and that they do happen and they happen repeatedly and they happen systematically and that nobody says or does anything. You know, I, I'm looking, I'm, I'm very glad to see all these faces here, you know, alhamdulillah, and, and I appreciate everybody coming. But I can't help thinking to myself, if, and I was telling this to Brother Hashmi over in the other, in the restaurant over there. If this was a mass fundraiser, I imagine there would be maybe 10 to 20 times as many chairs, and they would all be full. And keep in mind, a fundraiser, they're paying to get in. The food isn't free. You're probably paying a $50 ticket or more. Look at us here. We have free food here, and you don't have to pay to get in the door. 
and yet, like, and, you know, it's this clear benefit for you to know what's going on. But people are just, it's very challenging to, you know, to awaken in people's minds the threat that exists to them when they are not prepared to accept it. Yesterday I came, I came and prayed Joma here, as I was saying, and again, having been, having received that denial previously, I sat there as I was listening to the football, and I was listening to, and the Khatib, you know, he was talking about how we need to introduce righteousness into our lives, and how not just in writing, not just in speech, but in action, you know, that is the right thing to do. To do right, I think they call it orthopraxy. You know, because they say that Christianity is a religion of orthodoxy, which is correct belief, and Islam is a religion of orthodoxy and orthopraxy, correct belief and correct action. And that's not saying anything against like uh, Christianity, it's just a, a distinction that's important to note. And so, as I was sitting there listening to the, to the football, I was like, what is the right thing to do as my brother, as my brother is, has been sitting in solitary confinement for 703 days? 703 days for what? They say that he translated a book, he translated many books. You know, I mean, if you, if, if we're sitting in a civilized society here, we're rational people. You know, there's a difference between one person who translates one book with a title like that, and a person who translates 50 books, where that's one of the titles. You see, and if the book isn't illegal in Arabic, why should it be illegal in English? I mean, I went into a bookstore the other day, and somebody had written a book about where they translated all of the all of the messages of like, you know, Osama bin Laden and all, and all them. Barnes and Nobles. I'll expect to see that guy on the stand soon. But, um, so anyway, I was sitting there and I was thinking about this and I... I felt that I had to do something. I had to introduce that righteousness into my life. And what I, what I basically did was, right after the prayer was over, you know, it's... The prayer was here. I was actually sitting right there. And the hall is full of people. There's hundreds of people. And I stood up and I gave uh, I gave an announcement about Tara's case and about this event. And I really kind of, I, I implored people to come, not for Tara's sake, but for their own sake. You know, but again, you know, the, despite the fact that we got a very strong response here today, you know, I'm very happy to see people here again today. But... To see the response yesterday, you would have thought it would be greater. You know, and I'm not disappointed, you know, because this isn't something that they would do for me or for taught it. You know, this was, and I told them, so this was an opportunity for them to introduce that righteousness into their lives. But again, if people aren't prepared to do that, then they're not prepared to do that. And so that takes me back into the question of like, what are we really struggling for here? Who are we struggling for and what are we struggling against? You know, it's, the tide is very strong here and like we have to ask ourselves where the will to change that tide is really coming from. Where is that will coming from? Who wants to change that tide? Is it just us? Or the people that we're trying to save? And I'm not talking you know, about like your thought it and my thought it. I'm talking about like, let's say like me as a Muslim, like the Muslim community. Do they want to be saved? Do they want to be saved? Who are we saving them from? I was in Washington DC for an Islamic convention and you know, you see the same litanies that are being proliferated as they were 10 years ago. Nothing's changed. We're still in the Stone Age. That we're the nice guys. There's extremists over there. They're radicals. You know, like yes, they're probably saying this. And and it's funny, you know, because like you know, by creating that distinction, that polar distinction, like we're okay and they're radicals. He himself is kind of like behaving as a radical himself. You know, he's polarizing, you know, the conflict. When in fact, these people that, you know, that they claim to be, that they call radicals, they're not, you know what they are, they're not radicals. They're, unfortunately, they're Muslim youth who, like, desperately needed to have the proper leadership among the Muslim, like, American leadership. 
You know, like it's you can't go and be a Muslim American leader and sit there saying like, you know, we have our rights and we can exercise our rights when you have like the Taurus who are being, you know, utterly deprived of their rights and you can't you know, even forget about like what's happening with the Muslims. The history of this nation, unfortunately, it's always been like that. You know, I mean, this is the way it is when there's government. It's not just America. It's when there is, when there is that system in place. You know, you the rules apply when those in power want them to apply. So you can't go and tell like the Muslim youth here that like, don't worry, you're safe here. You have your freedom of speech. You have those rights. You can't say that. Now, I'm not saying that there's no hope, you know, because I, you know, I don't want people to walk away from this thinking that I'm saying that there's no hope. But what I'm saying is that Muslim leaders, and I don't think this will happen, unfortunately. Maybe somebody's more optimistic than I. Like, what would be ideal is that they should address the facts. They should present, you know, the Muslim youth who are trying to learn their identity in a post-9/11 world. Sorry, 60 seconds. They should tell these youth the truth about their religion and they should equip them to engage in spirited debate about it. They should not make them run away from it because the tide will only rise. Even if you run away from it, it'll only rise. And I mean, at this point, I'm wondering, like, you know, what are, what are our options for that? Me personally, sadly, I think that I'm ready to fold. I think that, like, you know, it's, I can live, my family can live a pleasant life overseas, and there's no need to, there's no need to, to risk that. It's not, it's not about, I'm sorry, 30 seconds. It's not about escaping it. It's not about escaping it, but it's about finding where you belong and being in a space where you can work alongside people who, where you can have coalitions that are actually like, you know, willing to change it. You know, like what we're doing is very brave here, but we need to have like, we need to have greater infrastructure. We need to have, we need to have that buy-in from down below. And what we're doing is right, but there will. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Tamid. Um, I just want to briefly comment. Um, we bring the families to, to, to speak because we want you to understand what they're going through. And we don't like to come to a community where family members um, feel that they're not supported by the community. And if I may, you know, uh, if, if I may um, impress on, on, on this committee or, or go beyond my, my bounds, I really, this community, I really, you know, encourage you to adopt the case um, for what the case is. Everyone deserves a, f a fair trial. Everyone is presumed innocent until proven guilty. And, and those are the things that we need to rally around. And we encourage local communities to support uh, these cases and, and, and the family. And Brother Tamir and his family shouldn't have to feel the way that they feel. Now, all of the speakers who have been here today are, have a right to their views. Not everything that they say uh, reflects our uh, views as NCPCF on a given situation, on a given uh, issue. For example, we don't encourage people to pick up and leave uh, the U.S. because the Muslim community is targeted, for example. And I know where Dr. Uh, uh, Tamid is coming from when he says that, but obviously we're here to empower and encourage those who are here to prevent that from happening to, to other people and that's we feel is our job as, as Muslims because for Muslims it's not where you live but it's the peace uh, of, of it's your heart being at peace wherever you are because on the day of judgment we will all face God as, as individuals so I understand where Dr. Tamid is coming from I just want you to know that we support you as NCPCF, we support your family, and we support uh, Tariq's right to a fair trial. We oppose any um, uh, egregious or, or any violations of law by our government, um, by law enforcement, by individuals, in all of these cases, in, including yours. I just want you to know that we don't uh, determine 
the outcome of these cases, and we don't, you know, um, um, support any individual case, but we support the three initiatives that we talked about. I will, there will be time, inshallah, for questions and, and, and answers, so I'm sure uh, Brother Tarapi will have an opportunity, uh, uh, Brother Tamman. Uh, let me just introduce our final uh, speaker, uh, Sister Sharmeen Siddiqui is the sister of Ihsanul, uh, Ihsanul quote-unquote Shifa Siddiqui who um, was unjustly prosecuted in Atlanta, Georgia and currently held in the Communication Management Unit in Marion, Illinois. Uh, Sharmeen is currently preparing to conduct her dissertation research in socio-cultural anthropology on the impact of the United States government's war uh, of terror on Muslim American youth, activism, and Islam. She enjoys uh, photography and paintings and exhibited artworks in the South and Midwest. Sharmeen serves as a member on the steering committee of the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace, everybody. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit of excerpt. So every few hours, I kept distracting my mother from reciting the Quran when we were driving to visit my brother Shifa last July at the federal prison in Marion, Illinois, which houses one of the two Muslim internment camps in the U.S. During our 10-hour drive from Michigan, I kept trying to find out when she was going to be finished with her recitation so I could listen to some music. I knew what you were thinking, but it was not she. At one point, a little agitated, my mother reacted. We're going to see Shifa after a long time. You need to pray that we can see him. It's a long drive. We need to make sure that we face no problem in our journey. And the prison gives us no trouble. My mother was sitting in the front passenger seat, gesturing with her hands in distress. She continued, we're not there for him at always. This is our only chance to see him. I'm reciting so Allah will help us in our journey, so we can see him without any problem. Looking anxious, she continued to tell me, I don't know how he's doing, what he is there. I'm not there for him anymore. I can't call him, send him food. I can't hug him at the prison. I'm praying that he is all right and we can see him. Fast forward to the visitation room. Uh, with a stretching smile and the longest Muslim greeting in Arabic, my brother Shiva welcomed us, my mother, my sister, who flew in from Atlanta, Georgia, and me. In the visitation room where a plexiglass window separated him from us as we spoke over the phones. This is how we, we usually held our face-to-face -face visitation with him. In watery eyes, my mother asked Shiva about his well-being. Abu, an affectionate term for sons. Abu, have you had breakfast this morning? What did you have? Alhamdulillah, I had breakfast. Alhamdulillah, many praise be to God. Shifa replied. My mother looked at him again and said, Did you sleep well last night? Smiling, Shifa answered, Alhamdulillah. Do you need anything? Has your sister been sending you money regularly? My mother probed. With a, sm with a radiant smile, my, my brother Shifa responded, Alhamdulillah, me. I'm in the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing to worry. A sequence of routine questions followed from my mother. Have you, have you bought any items from the commissary, from the canteen? How much money do you have left? Do they give you fruits and vegetables with your meal every day? How is the temperature in your room? Is it normal? As always, Shifa answered with Alhamdulillah. My mother then asked if we could get him something from the venting machine. He didn't want anything. She offered to buy him some cookies, chips, soda. He declined again. She then looked at me and my sister, and raising her voice a little, she said, why don't you get him something? Why are you guys sitting here? He doesn't want anything, I replied. My mother countered. He doesn't want anything because you haven't bought him anything. Besides, these are all junk food, I added. Noticing a tension brewing, my brother interjected with a smile. I don't want anything, Ami. Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Breaking into tears, my mother begged him to eat something. Eat something, Abu. You're looking paler than the last time I saw you. Your cheeks have sunken in. I know you won't eat anything they give you. They don't let me bring any food for you. Her voice cracked as she looked at him in anguish and sobbed. If I was here with you, I would cook for you every day. This is all I can do for you. 
Tell your sister to get you something. I don't know when I will see you again. Will I be ever able to make your favorite dishes? Only Allah knows when I will be back again. Let me get you something. Weeping, my mother insisted on feeding her son something, anything. I don't know whether being able to feed her son something quenched the emptiness my mother felt from having unjustly lost her son to prison. I don't know, I don't know a mother seeing her son eat something before her eyes, satisfy or fulfill the need a mother feels to take care of her son or a child. My mother's connection to Shifa, my little brother, went back to the moments when my parents, standing in the desert of Arafah in Saudi Arabia in 1985, invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them a son. It was a much deeper spiritual connection my mother felt with her little son when Allah blessed her by fulfilling her prayers, deepening, her, deepening their connection incomprehensible by others. This relationship was more intensified when Shifa, as an infant, developed chronic asthma and breathing problems to the point for where he had to be fed with tubes through his nostrils. His little, little delicate and fragile body was wrapped and constricted with tubes, making us worry whether he was going to survive. My, my mother spent sleepless nights and days crying, making sure she was always there for him, ensuring he was breathing and alive. We had all, especially my mother, developed a special bond with my little, little brother Shifa as a result. My brother Shifa was kidnapped by the Bangladeshi military at the behest of our U.S. government when he and his wife were returning home from shopping 12 days after their wedding in April of 2006. He was kept in an, he was kept in an undisclosed location in a military camp and missing for four days. Before the FBI brought him back to, to, the, to New York in a secrecy rendition aircraft and we learned about his whereabouts from CNN. He used to translate Islamic literature from Arabic to English for a Muslim publication website, photos from his tourist trips, online chats of teenagers concerned about Muslims and oppressed people in the world, and their feeling of responsibility were used against him as evidence in his case. The prosecutor, at the opening and closing statement, informed the court and confirmed at the conclusion of the trial that there was no plot or plan to destroy any cities or building anywhere in the world that there were no weapons of mass destruction. In fact, the prosecutors admitted my brother never came close to or had an access to such instruments. Silence and shocked for a month from the news of my brother's kidnap and arrest, my, my, brother, my mother broke down one day, shedding tears of pain and confusion during our 12-hour drive from New York City to Michigan after my, brother, my brother's first bail hearing in Brooklyn, New York. We started driving after Fajr, dawn prayer, when the pastel rose morning sky began to breeze in. After reciting Surah Yasin and Surah Rahman, two chapters from the Quran, she raised her hands up in the air, beseeching Allah to have mercy on her family, her beloved son, and asking for his release. She cried profusely, invoking Allah, shifting her sitting positions in the front passenger seat every now and then. Sometimes the palms of her hands closely pressed pressed her cheeks, water running between her fingers. Sometimes she hunched over in agony, covering her face with her arms, drenching her clothes with tears. And sometimes she raised her hands up in the air, reciting prayers in Arabic and Bengali, her grief and despair streaming down her face. Other times she wiped her tears and nose with her scarf or shirt or tissue, pressuring her palms against her cheeks so deeply like she was hurting herself. Her voice broke between loud and soft, painful sounds of imploring Allah for forgiveness and freedom for her son and for all the sons in prison unjustly. Twelve hours of supplication between her five worshipping times in the car. I could have sworn her despair, finding no space, burst out of my car to the calm green mountains that surrounded, surrounded us driving through northwestern Pennsylvania, summoning the leaves in the trees to pray, for, pray with her for her son. Her anguish ruptured the sky in the late afternoon that day, making it angry at the injustice meted out to her, telling her in cloudburst that it is in solidarity with her. I had no words to comfort my mother that day. My mother then started fasting for over a year until she developed new health illnesses. But it was more like she was punishing herself by withholding food from her body in her inability to be there for her son. How could she enjoy food when her son could not have the same food or have an adequate meal? 
This is the nature and the impact of US government's violence on my mother, encroaching on her female body and invisibly punishing her and her family. She is, however, not the only one enduring this violence. You have heard um, Marlene, another mother before me. I cannot understand or articulate what a mother feels for, for her child or the nature of the center of her pain. But I have seen how my mother and many mothers in this situation loved and grieved for their children unjustly imprisoned. How does a mother fulfill her role of motherhood and maintain a mother-child relationship when a child is imprisoned? How does a mother nurture a child when incarceration makes it impossible to take care or be there for the child? How does a parent, especially mothers, who are assumed to be caregivers fulfill this role when they are also stigmatized and labeled as being the relative of a terrorist when the child has not committed any acts of terrorism as proven by the court of law? What ambiguous position my mother and all the mothers occupy in society as a result of the violence of US government on, the, on these Muslim mothers and their families. But we don't acknowledge these aspects. Because if we are to acknowledge the violence committed by the US state on Muslim mothers, we also have to acknowledge, we also have to recognize the pain of these mothers and, and their love for their imprisoned children. And if we do this, then we have to affirm the humanity of their children, the human worth of the most young Muslim men and women unjustly preemptively incarcerated. This is how our government has been waging its violence against Muslim mothers of prisoners. So when CNN book broke the news of my brother's whereabouts, many relatives and friends stopped communicating with us for fear, distrust, or perhaps confusion. But on that day, a non-Muslim woman, a professor from a local university we have known for some time, she came over and stayed with my mother the entire day talking and comforting her. My mother was amazed by how this woman prayed, performing the bodily movements of, of the prayers with her when she offered her daily worships. So in this audience, there, there, are, there are mothers, victims. Um, there's a mother here with us whose son is currently incarcerated in Boston, Tarek Mahanna, that we have heard about. I wonder how she and her family are coping with the circumstances. I wonder what the contour of her pain is from having a child unjustly imprisoned. I wonder how many people here offer or would like to offer her support and stand in solidarity with her. Jazakallah. Understand the history of struggle and movements of this country, 
what struggles we've gone through, what things we want, how we want them. Uh, some tactics can't be used anymore, and some things were done that were clear mistakes, and people ended up in jail. You know, some of those tactics. But uh, throughout, we were in the black community here, we've had, well, we'll go back to Garvey, the boys, Booker T, there was three prong struggle. The boys was for the town and tent. Got, um, uh, Booker T was for uh, trades and teaching people how to uh, learn trades. And uh, Garvey was back to Africa, right? And then there was the next wave comes up, it was Martin, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and the uh, Panther Party, three, three prongs. One uh, got legitimized, the uh, peaceful nonviolent movement, Martin Luther King got legitimized, and the Panther Party movement got, got criminalized, and the people got put, sent to jail. But we, the lesson in that is our community allowed them to split us, you see? They split us, and they let those political prisoners in the Panther Party stay in jail, and a lot of them are still in jail today. And and if you got a movement that's divided like that, they, they win. We see, you can look around the world at other movements that are not divided. You know, like in Ireland, the IRA and the same thing. Like uh, in South Africa, uh, we had uh, the ANC in Kanto with Sisri. They always had two prongs, two prong approach. They had the armed struggle and they had the above board to when they organize it in the community. So, like I said before, we can't, as a wheel, the spokes, we can't eliminate one of the spokes and let that go. The wheel's going to be wobbly. It's not going to work. It's got to be a whole. Thank you. Other uh, questions, please? Thanks. I just wanted to respond to the same question. Just based on our experience in Albany, we didn't have a wonderful victory because we, you know, Yasin and Muhammad got sent to prison for 15 years. But I do know for a fact that if our community hadn't come together and organized, they would be doing 30 years because that was the bottom of the sentencing guidelines for them. And it was all the support from the community, the people coming to court, the letters, the petitions, the vigils we had every week that saved 15 years of their sentence. So, you know, you do what you can. If you don't come together, and, and we would have had more cases in Albany, and the president of the mosque, Shamshad Awad, probably would have been targeted as well if we hadn't worked with him substantially. And so, you know, you don't see all the cases you, you prevent from organizing. So it's a whole lot better if you do stand up and organize, and that's the only way things are going to get better. 